Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Can we all stand? I don't know about you, but for me, this has been a week. Amen. This has been a week. I've had things I've had to endure, but I'm here tonight. Amen. This is a place that I run to. This is a safe place. This is a place that fixes things, makes me feel better, more joy. This is the house of the Lord, and I'm thankful to be here. Amen. We're going to have a time of prayer to begin the service. And uh, the past few weeks, past several weeks, we've put an emphasis on prayer because prayer, Uncle Shannon, is what changes things. Prayer is the key to revival. Prayer is the key to miracles. Prayer is the key to everything. Salvation. And I believe that we're going to start seeing more and more miracles. I, I This week, had a blessing. Only God. How many can testify? We, we've all had it happen. And that's just the beginning. I believe that there's going to be some needs tonight that are met because of your faith. So do we have any needs over on this side? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Anybody here in the middle? Yes, let's remember Nanny. Sister Eloise. Yes, ma'am. Sister Margaret. Brother Derek. In Jesus' name. Brother Ray. Yes, sir. Brother Billy. Sir, Sister Michelle. We will. Anybody on this side, Sister Nadine? remember brother Manning let's let's remember let's remember him and uh, sister Manning they've both been on my mind lately some of the best people you'll ever meet anybody else on this side all right anybody up here I believe that the Lord is going to make a way. Amen. Even when it doesn't look like there is a way, he'll make one. Amen. Can we take these needs before the Lord with anticipation that they're going to be met? Lord, I pray right now. God, first I come with thanksgiving in my heart, thanksgiving in my mind. I'm thankful, Lord, that I'm here, thankful that I'm blessed, thankful for your spirit guiding and directing me into all truth. God, I pray. For every need that was mentioned in this place, every sickness, God, every person that has a need in their life, every every person battling a circumstance, financial, physical, mental, God, there's so many different needs. I pray that you'll make a way, Lord, when there was no way, that that somebody that's going through something, 
that their need will be met tonight because of somebody's faith. God, just by the mentioning of the name, because we take it to you, we take it before your cross, just because of that much faith, God, I pray that you honor that and that we will see the needs met. God, and I pray that there's testimonies that we start hearing of, reports, good reports that are coming in. And I give you the praise, Lord. I'm, I'm praising you in advance because I'm believing. I believe you're a miracle, miracle working God. I've seen you do it before and I'm going to see you do it again. God, I'm believing because of faith. There's faith that is rising up. God, and I pray for our country. Lord, I pray for Ukraine and Russia and all these different needs that are going on in the world right now. Lord, I pray that, that what the devil is trying to do and to distract and uh, to divide, I pray that we have unity. Unity in the only thing that we can have unity in, in Jesus Christ. God, that your word will go forth, that your spirit will be poured out, and that we will see revival upon this nation. We will see revival upon this church, that we will see revival in our community. I believe it in the name of Jesus. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise and worship him? There's a liberty in the house tonight, in the name of Jesus.
hallelujah. Can we lift our hands up to the Lord? Hallelujah. Not because everything's great. Not because everything in my life is the way it should be, but because he is who he, sh- who he is. He's who he says he is. He's the I am. He was the same today as he was yesterday. And he's going to be the same tomorrow. Amen. It may not be perfect in my life. I may be going through some problems. I may not have it all figured out, but he does. And I know that I can take my needs to him. I know that I can come to the house and that I can be safe under his hand. There's a covering over this place. There's a covering of safety. There's a covering of refuge. I know that he is my safety. And I can rest in that. There's comfort in that. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. You all may be seated for a brief moment. We're going to take up our tithing and offering at this time. I I want to share just a quick testimony, though, real quick. Uh, Like I said, we've got many of them happening. Like like Dad said, we don't even know most of them. Most people report that stuff to him, and he doesn't tell it. But there's some testimonies every single week of people being blessed. And it ain't because of the words that we're saying, but it's the faith that you have when you say them. Amen. It's not, it's not just what you say, but what you, how you say it. Same as with the heart. It's what is in your heart. And uh, anyways, the testimony I wanted to share goes back some time, but fasting this week kind of made me think of it. Uh, back when me and Sophia was trying to buy our house, and I've told this testimony in here before, but... Uh, of course, the market wasn't the way it is now, so the price was way different. But we made an offer on our house, and uh, me and her, were, we were talking back and forth. And I remember I was at work one day, and we had made an offer, and they declined it. And she called me, and uh, she really wanted this house. And, uh, but we also talked about it and said, she said, how do we know it's the Lord's will? And I said, well, we're going to fast three days for it and pray and uh, and I felt impressed by the Lord we talked about it and said we're not going to make another offer if it's the Lord's will he'll make a way and uh, I don't even I can't remember and she might I can't remember if it was at the end of the fast or during the three day fast but she called me one day just and I, I get chills thinking about it it's, it's not the greatest testimony in the world but the day, that feeling that I got, there's nothing like it. But when she called me that day and, and was crying and said, I got to tell you something. And I said, what is it? And she said, they just called me back. And they said they got to talking and thinking about it. And they decided to take our original offer. And I said, well, that's just confirmation that the Lord said that this is it. Hey, Amen. We didn't even have to make another offer. We didn't have to do anything. The Lord said, I'm going to make the original one work. Amen. How many times do you see that? When you make an offer on a house and they decline it, most of the time it's either going to be higher or somebody else is going to come in. But they called back and they said that. And, and, and like I said, it ain't the greatest deal in the world. But to me and her, that moment, I'll share it for the rest of my life, that, that feeling of faith, Brother Terrence. Your faith, when, when it happens, you're like, Lord, it, it's like you're surprised, but you're not surprised. There's nothing like it. Amen. He blessed us this week. Uh, not going to go into detail, but just surprises. Just can't explain it. Just the Lord makes a way. Amen. I, I, one thing I've found out, not even in financially, but just life, is it's going to be all right. It, even when you're not living the way you're supposed to, Brother Terrence, you know, it, it's going to be all right. The Lord, the Lord takes care of us. He, he wants you to succeed. He wants you to be able to pay your bills. He wants you to be able to have blessings in your life. He, we forget that He loves us. We're His children. Amen. We've got several different ways to give. Give Lefi, PayPal, and uh, cash and checks can be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals at P.O. Box 477. New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. Or you can text GIVE to 833-883-9311. And that's text to GIVE. Amen. I know one thing is we've made 
there's many ways to give. That is a, that's very accommodable. I will say that. I, I have never really thought about it a whole lot till recently, but that is, that's a blessing to our leadership in the church. There's so many different ways that are accommodating for you and me to make it easy to give. Amen. If we all can, let's stand as she's getting the, the prayer up there. And like I said, it's not just the words that you're saying, but it's the faith that it takes to say them. We got to get past ourselves and we got to get into step into the supernatural. We got to step into faith. Amen. I, I got a message brewing, but it's all about faith. Everything we do is about faith. I believe it. If you do, if you believe it too, say it with me. Upon the authority of your word I have given, and it shall be given unto me, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings. I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked, the curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there's not enough room to receive it. And we receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received, my whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing. I'm blessed going in and I'm blessed going out and all that I do will prosper in Jesus name. Amen. Remember the golden pans for tithing? Wooden pans are for offering. Give as the Lord has given unto you, and let's worship.
Hallelujah. Can we just give him one awesome hand clap of praise for just a minute? Just a minute. Just give him everything for just about 30 seconds. He's worthy. He's worthy of my praise. He bared my cross. He chose me for this moment. He chose me for this calling. He's worthy. He's worthy of more than my praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's a liberty in this house. On a Wednesday night, there's a liberty in this house. A freedom. A freedom to worship. Hallelujah. That's what I love about Pentecost. Is the freedom to worship. Amen. And my God loves it too. Amen. He loves worship. Just like uh, Brother Larry, your dad, whoever said it last week. Brother Tenney always said it. Worship is what the Lord loves most. Amen. Amen. You may all be seated as the kids come line up at the front. I want to make one announcement. Uh, there will be no service out on the river Sunday due to the forecasted weather and the cold temperatures. They're calling for some snow and stuff. And uh, I pray against that, first of all. I'm ready for it to just start warming up a little bit. And... Uh, we're going to have our 2 o'clock service, though, here at the church. There will be no elements class, no Sunday school classes. But I do want to say, I, I got a feeling that Sunday is going to be something. Because we're going to come into this place. And then we're going to be able to give it all. When we played sports, Brother Blake, when we had them double headers and stuff, when we only had one game, we came and we played hard. I believe that Sunday we're going to come and play hard. Amen. Is anybody else going to play hard with me Sunday? I got faith. I got faith there's going to be miracles. I, I got faith the Holy Ghost is going to be poured out. Amen. Amen. Kids, you can go ahead and be led back. And I also believe tonight's going to be awesome. Uh, I love being a part of the youth class, and we're having revival back there. But I do wish that I was out here because of what y'all was learning about. And uh, that book, there's something powerful in that book there's some powerful teaching amen as dad coming up here the youth can go ahead and be dismissed to the back also amen and i want to say i'm thankful that you're here amen. god's about to do something amen. praise the lord um i uh i want to add one thing to sunday since we don't start till two o'clock it's the day the time goes forward. That's why we started doing that, because everybody be all tore up over losing that one hour of sleep. Come on, somebody. Like it messes up your whole world. People used to, sometimes they wouldn't even come, Brother Terrence. I'm just too tired. So we fixed that. But here's what I'm going to ask you. Now, while he was announcing that, a whole lot of folks was talking. You got to hear. You got to hear. I, wouldn't I can't tell you how many people would come up to me and say, I didn't know that. And I said, well, it was in the bulletin. We announced it at church. And you was here. At 1.30. Come early and pray. Service doesn't start till 2 o'clock. So come 1.30. And let's have a good 30 minutes of prayer. Prayer meeting before church starts. What do you say? Uh, we can do that. We can do that. You don't have to get up early. You don't even have to set an alarm clock. Uh, you can just uh, get up when you get up. And uh, But it will be here at the church, at the River Bend, on Sunday at 2 o'clock. But we start at 1.30. Amen? Amen? So uh, uh, that's something we really need to try to get a revival of pre-service prayer. Uh, it's a, it's a, a deal maker. It changes things. And we do have several that pray. Um, last week, uh, the bait of Satan, part nine. And uh, you need some more copies? Mm -hmm. I know we, uh, we ain't got 20 people here tonight that wasn't here last week. Come on, somebody. Uh, and I gave y'all a fair enough warning. Uh, you only thing is... Brother Shannon, is my computer messed up right before church? Yeah, I'm, I got it shut down. I hope it gets healed uh, while it's shut down. Thank you, Brother Blake. 
Uh, what I really hope about these handouts is you can't lay them down all week. Spend a little time going over it again and again and again. And uh, that's, that's the whole purpose of it. I really would like it, Sister Crystal, if everybody would go home, take their hand out, and watch it all over again. Huh? And you get something else out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to struggle for a minute, but I'm coming out. Y'all better be ready. I'm glad to see all of you here tonight. This one of those nights my phone was blowing up with, I can't make it, I can't make it, I got this, I'm not feeling well, and, and I, you know, I automatically start seeing an empty sanctuary. But uh, thank you for coming tonight. And uh, uh, I'm going to tell you this, I, I don't really want it. Uh, I, I won't tell any details, but I got a phone call right before church from a friend that lives in another state, and uh, uh, they've... Uh, They've had a situation come up where they got some money, and uh, he told me expect a thousand dollar offering in the mail just any day now that they're going to be sending to us. So it it works, folks. Amen. Amen. It uh, it works. Uh, and uh, I was I'm just so excited, so excited. On, about on a monthly basis, it's not weekly yet, but about on a monthly basis, somebody that watches us online starts giving. And uh, so, I mean, my goodness, uh, I, uh, I went to, uh, I was invited to come to the school on Monday. They had an alumni day, and uh, they invited me to come back. I think I was a fill-in uh, because I didn't know about it, but for a few days, but they invited me to come speak. And let me tell you something. You teachers, I love all of y'all. Y'all got the hardest job in the whole world. I had to talk to every one of them classes for 50 minutes. All right? Okay. Six hours. I had to talk to them kids for 50 minutes. And I had uh, one class I was in. The young fella, uh, the young fella was only there about 10 minutes. And he had to get up and go to another class. And uh, um, I didn't see much out of him. Well, I went to the library. They've, they've redone the media center out there, and it's incredible, by the way. The whole school is a lot of, lot of good improvements. And uh, so they took us to see the media center, and uh, uh, he was in there. And uh, sitting at the desk, and he looked at me when I came in, and he said, I walked over there, and he said, what church you pastor? Or where's your church? And I told him, I said, okay. I, he, wasn't in the, he wasn't in there 10 minutes out of the 50. Well, Sister Leanne comes tonight and tells me that uh, you work with his mama. And he went home and told his mama, he said, I had a speaker today, and he was a pastor, and I found out where his church is, and I want to go. Because there was something different about him out of all them other people that were speaking. And I want you to find out. I, 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 he knows where it's at, and he plans on coming. Come on, somebody. Huh? I promise to goodness, I was not walking out of that school at 3 o'clock thinking, Booyah, I got all them kids. I was walking out of there feeling like I need to get a real job. Okay? But we plant and we water. And God said he'd give the increase. Yeah. Believe it. Believe it. We've got uh, uh, Brother Blake, Brother Cody, and Brother uh, Terrence, man of God, that have been going to uh, Hope Ministries at Katrin and teaching Bible studies and visiting with those guys over there. And now they've got them coming to recovery with them. And, and there's incredible things happening. People are working. we got hands in the harvest. Amen. And with that being said, we can't afford to get offended. We ain't got time to get offended and get all in our feelings and stuff. We're going to get left. You waste about five seconds with your lips stuck out and you're going to be left behind because God is moving. Part nine, the rock of offense. I'm just going to summarize this for you. Sometimes you're going to come to church and the word is going to hurt your feelings. Sometimes the word 
the message of Jesus Christ is going to upset you. It is. There are going to be things. Now hear this. There are going to be things and areas where God leads the man of God. All right? There are going to be places where God leads me that he doesn't consult you first. Okay? It's true. He doesn't come run through the crowd and say, before I whoop this on your pastor, I'm going to make sure it's all right with you. Now, what I have to understand is I've had time to pray and to fast and to hear from God on something, and sometimes it's a bombshell on you. All right? Now, I've got to understand that. So when you don't, you know, just start jumping up, shaking your pom-poms and doing the splits because it's the greatest thing in the world, i got to give you a little time to assimilate it because I done had weeks to do that because I ain't brought you nothing that I ain't done got from the Lord. Okay? But it's sometimes we're going to have to be patient with one another. And the proof's in the pudding. Huh? If people are growing, people are coming in, God's doing good things, God's blessing, and the Holy Ghost is being poured out, let's ride with it. 1 Peter 2, 6 and 8. Therefore it is also contained in the Scriptures. I'm in the New King James Version. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. That's the Lord Jesus Christ they're speaking of. And he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Now, I just want to, I'm, I'm just going to hit this and then we're going to move ahead, okay? Because we done taught this last week. If you weren't here last week, go home and look it up. The Bait of Satan, part nine, uh, chapter 9, part 1, okay? But he said, you won't be put to shame if you believe on me. And I told you that that word shame is you won't be flustered. You won't be frustrated. You won't be having to flit all around trying to find an answer. Or, you know, you won't have to get upset. There won't be upheaval. But you'll be confident and you will refer everything to him. Okay? Therefore, to you who believe, he's precious. But to those who are disobedient, he's the stone which the builder rejected. And... The two contrasting states of this passage are believers and the disobedient. Because it goes without saying, it is understood, it is elementary, that if you believe, you'll do it. If you believe, you'll obey. If you don't believe, you won't. All right? So... Jesus Christ offended people. Everybody didn't love Jesus. All right? Everybody didn't love Jesus. And a close look at the ministry of Jesus, if you're on your handout with me, I'm in Jesus and offenses. Okay, I added just a touch to this. It won't mess you up, Sister Heidi. But I, I, I want to... Uh, I, I'm going to just talk about Jesus and his offenses, and I'm going to give you a little tidbit of, of how that relates to us. As lo Jesus was a merciful Savior. He was a healer. He was a deliverer. He opened a blinded eyes. He fed 5,000. He, he was compassionate toward people. One particular boy got raised up from the dead just because Jesus was compassionate on his mama yeah. at the city of Nain. So, Jesus was also offensive to many. Now, I didn't say this last week, but I want you to think about it. Who did Jesus offend the most? Religious folks. He was more offensive to religious people than he was to sinners. Matter of fact, Brother Ronnie, sinners loved him. They thronged him. They flocked to him. And he had preached to them. And the Pharisees and scribes and all those other people, they'd come listen to do what? Criticize, judge, find fault, try to trip him up. Okay? But Jesus Christ did not change his message any more than he changed who he was. He was also offensive to many because of the truth 
he unfailingly preached. Hear me now. John the Baptist and Jesus, their first message was the same words. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You're going to have to be changed by the word I preach. Jesus' main conflict was with the Pharisees. The Pharisees were one of three prominent religious parties that were active at the time of Jesus along with the Sadducees and the Essenes. But the Pharisees were the most influential and they did not like Jesus except on the slick. It's true. When they won, the ones that did like him come to him at the nighttime or when nobody else was around because Jesus messed with the Pharisees. What did he mess with? Their standing? What do I mean by their standing? Who'd they think they were? The elite. The best of the best. And truthfully, Brother Shannon, from all appearances, they felt like they had arrived. Nothing more to learn, nowhere else to go. We are the ones that brought you here. Okay, look to us, all right? And also, he messed with their traditions. We struggle with both things. I want us to get delivered from this, but that old business, I know everybody sits in the same place because it's comfortable. There's coming a day when you better get here early. There's coming a day and it's going to be a beautiful day when you set somewhere different every service. Amen. Now, you say, well, that's not really that big a deal. It's only a big deal because it is the representation of how we feel. It's a sense of entitlement. Back in the day, it ain't going to happen now. Mainly because I'm going to cloud up and rain on you if it happens. But you better not come in here to no visitor who sat in your seat and tell him they need to move. But it used to happen. Oh, it used to happen. Miss Marie Hunter told me Mr. Robert Riley would kick somebody out of his seat every time at the Catholic Church. Okay, it ain't just in our church. It's everywhere. People want it their way, when they want it, how they want it, and don't mess with it. Tom Rainer's book, I know I'm staying here for a minute, but I want to. Tom Rainer's book called I Am a Church Member, he likens church to the country club. I pay my dues. That means my opinion matters. I pay my dues so they better start when I want, stop when I want, sing what I want, have the temperature set like I want, fix the lights like I want. Let me tell you something. Sister Ruth taught it to us way back when I first started pastoring. This church don't exist for us. Amen. It exists for those that are coming in. Yes. Right. Say, I don't like that too much. I don't know what to tell you. Because if it exists just for us, you know what it's going to do? Die. Die. What do you think now? We've got quite a number of new worshipers and we baptized a lot of people and had several get the Holy Ghost and, and we got some things happening now. You know why we're feeling like we're revived? Because we got some people that have been. I'm sorry. Jesus messed with their standing and their traditions. The Pharisees had a good grasp of the letter of the law, but they didn't understand the spirit of the law at all. Jesus called them hypocrites. He said, y'all draw nigh to me. You act religious, but your heart ain't right. You worship me vain, and you've turned your personal preferences into commandments. You want everybody to be like you, act like you, talk like you, well, I came to mess that up. That's what Jesus is saying. Now, the Pharisees, I mean the disciples, 
came to Jesus after he called the Pharisees hypocrites and they said, Lord, y'all remember what he said to them? You know you offended them people? The disciples said that. Lord, you know you defended them, offended them? And the Lord said, every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted, Matthew 15, 13 through 14, every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. And he said, let them alone. They're blind leading the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, they'll both fall in the ditch. Now, sometimes the truth hurts because it's meant to. Because every time we go to a new level, some folks can't come with you. Not because they can't, but because they won't. That's why we got millions of denominations in the world. Beginning with Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation, everybody that got a new taste of revelation thought they got all revelation. So they took one step away and built the whole city of religion. Then they got a little more revelation, and it was all heading back to Pentecost. That's the truth. It's all heading back to the day of Pentecost because that's the foundation of the early church. That's why they call us Pentecostal. You know that? That's why they call us Pentecostal. It's because we preach, teach, believe, and live the same experience of the apostles on the day of Pentecost. Can I get an amen? amen? Say, no, you think you're elite. No, I don't. That's not, that's not it at all. That's why I keep preaching. So everybody can hear the truth. Right? So a true disciple of Jesus Christ will realize if the word upset me, God's doing something in me. So Jesus grieved over those that left, but he did not let their leaving or their threatening to leave or their improper behavior move him from his mission. And he kept on reaching people. And he kept on impacting people. This is new stuff. Let's go here. Jesus offended those of his own hometown. Now, how does that relate to us? Here's how it relates to us. Are you ready? We live in a small community. Now, I'm fixing to surprise some of y'all. There's people around don't like God using you. You getting scared, Brother Ronnie? You think I'm about to wade off into... Something, you might be right. When God uses somebody that you know a whole lot about them and it offends you, we're about to get delivered from that. Because I'm telling you right now, if the Lord will use you, he'll use anybody. That's what happened. Jesus come to Nazareth and there was a whole lot of needs at Nazareth. It's the town he was raised in. He had a desire to help them, to do things for them and Sister Sheila, the Bible said there was great work to be done there but he couldn't do it because they couldn't get past who they saw him as. He's the carpenter's son. Mary's son, the brother of James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and he's got sisters. And since they couldn't tell where his power and authority came from, they made their decision about him based on what they knew about him. I said, since they didn't know where this authority came from or where this power came from, they just decided to disqualify him because they knew him and knew he wasn't ever going to mount to much. It's true. They couldn't determine what was going on in his life. They couldn't explain it away. 
So they just decided to disqualify him because of his past. Aren't you glad to serve a God that don't hold your past against you? I think it's time for the church to line up with the Lord and stop holding people's past against them and stop getting offended when somebody comes up here or comes in here or somebody gets blessed or gets the Holy Ghost and you used to get high with them. Did you forget you was there with them? Boy, my sister Dana, man, we are nervous if in church tonight because they're wondering. I wonder where he's going. You just hold on. I'm going to get where you are. I've been teaching this church since before revival started. I told this church seven or eight years ago, God's going to bring people in here that you fell out with out there and never made up with. God's going to bring your enemies to the church. Get ready. And it's happened. You can't get offended if God reaches for somebody you don't like. Am I doing all right, Brother Cody? What about you, Brother? Good buddy from Morehouse, Kevin Abernathy. They grew so angry at him. There's a message here. I'm not preaching it yet, but there's a message here. At Nazareth, they got so mad at him, they tried to kill him. But he never did compromise who he was. He just went back to Capernaum or went back where he came from where somebody wanted to listen. Let me tell you this. Are you ready? This ain't. This is going to cause a little trouble too, especially for me. Jesus offended his family members. I didn't know this was in the Bible, what I'm about to teach you. I did not know it till I read the bait of Satan. How does that apply to us? When you don't get a friends and family pass and or your friends and family don't understand where you're going and what God's doing in your life. When you don't get a friends and family pass from the word or when your friends and family don't understand, they can't comprehend where you're going and what God's doing in your life. Get ready for people to be offended at what God's doing in your life, not because they don't like you, but because they don't understand. And hear me right now, don't get offended at them. You, did you hear what I said? Don't get offended at them. It ain't personal. Mark 3, 21. But when his own people, that's Jesus' people. Other translations say, but when his family heard about this, Jesus is out there preaching, they was embarrassed of him. It's right here. And they went out and grabbed a hold of him and told everybody he's out of his mind. Did y'all know that was in the Bible? I never, I've never, I didn't know it. Makes me feel good because me and him got something in common. Everybody thinks we're crazy. Okay? At least our family members. That's, that's just. So in verse 31, this makes sense now. This never made sense to me either. This makes sense to me now. Then his brothers and his mother came and standing outside, they sent word in calling him. So somebody come into where Jesus was teaching and said, hey, hey, bud, your mom and your brothers is outside. Now they just came, got a hold of him a few minutes ago and was ashamed of him, embarrassed. Has anybody ever run into that? That your family was embarrassed of you because of the change God was making in your life? If you hadn't, you will. Okay? But he answered them saying, Who is my mother? 
are my brothers. And he looked around in a circle at those standing about him or set about him and he said, here's my mother and my brothers. Verse 35, are you ready? For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. I never understood that till I figured out. Here's what was happening. Jesus clearly rebuts any idea that those close to him could get a pass on faithless behavior just because of their position. He doesn't dispute their natural standing, but clearly separates the natural from the spiritual, especially as it pertains to the fulfillment of what he's called to do. Your family may not grasp what God's doing in your life, but be excited about that because Jesus' family didn't either. And they may, in fact, question your sanity. I think that happened to Sister Carol when she got the Holy Ghost. Some of her family said she went crazy. Talked about getting her put away somewhere. She needs to be happy. She was in the will of God. Because they may question your sanity in the manner in which you're pursuing God and the effect that that pursuit has on you. They may question your sanity in the manner in which you are pursuing God because you've graduated from being religious to operating in the spirit and there's a difference. But be assured, if you maintain your commitment, everybody say keep your commitment. And do not take the bait of offense. You better not ever fall out with your family because they don't understand what God's doing in your life. Don't you fall out with them. Don't take it personal. And don't go squalling and crying to everybody about it. They just don't understand. But you... You want to help them? You get your nose in the word and you get something down in your heart that nothing can take away from you and you keep living it and when they're sick, you pray for them and when they're hurting, you comfort them and you be a Christian to your family. Because look at here. Acts chapter 1, 12 through 14. Then return they unto Jerusalem. That's the, that's the disciples and another group of folks. They, this is after Jesus has been called away and he told them, go tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went into an upper room. That's the room they were in when the Holy Ghost fell where both, both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus and Simon, Zelotus and Judas, the brother of James, that's 11 disciples. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and who else? Oh, I didn't give you that. It's in my notes. Guess who was in the upper room? Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Because Jesus didn't change who he was. He didn't bow down to their feelings. He didn't change uh, what he preached and what he taught because they thought he was crazy. He just kept on preaching and he just kept on teaching and he kept on living. And when they needed him, he was there for them. And when Pentecost rolled around, guess where they were? Right there where the spirit was being poured out. You want your family saved? Keep living like a Christian in front of them. Hold on to your commitment. Don't you back down from what God's doing in your life and don't you stop pursuing the Lord because people that you love don't understand it. They're going to get offended at you. They're going to get offended at you because you're going places they can't go. Just hold on. They'll be there. Now, Jesus offended his own staff, his disciples, those closest to him. You know when you're going to get offended? It's happened. It'll happen again. When you're called to ramp up your commitment and you think you're already committed. 
And when you're called to ramp up your commitment into a place where you don't really understand it, because the book does say, to whom much is given, much is required. John 6 and 60 and 61. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Which kind of, what are they saying to him? I'm not sure that you're not asking too much out of us. Well, that's a hard saying. Matter of fact, who, who could handle it? If the Lord says it to you, you can handle it. Ain't that right, Sister Sheila? Look here. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, so what does that tell us? Now, here I come, Brother Larry. You better have to follow me because I'm getting, I'm going to meddle just a little bit right now. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? Take me to the next verse, 61. Is it in there? Is it 62? No, no, back up. You're right. You're right. They heard something from Jesus they didn't like. And instead of having the courage to say something to him about it, what did they do? Went and got in a little group. Did you hear that? I ain't too happy about it. What do you think? I just don't like it. Matter of fact, he's getting on my nerves. We've been doing pretty cotton picking good. We've followed him all over the place, and we've left things, and, and, and now he's telling us we got to step it up some more. If you do that, he knows it just as much as he knew it then. It's okay. I learned that at Caterpillar. I did. We worked at Caterpillar together. And we had a plant manager that had a great idea of how to do things. He said, if you don't like something, you come to me and let's talk about it. He said, we might do what you want and we might not. But at least the air is clean between us. Okay? Jesus said to his disciples... Y'all got a problem with what I just said? Or here's how he said it. Did I offend you? Verse 66. From that time. Mama, my pointer run out of juice, or I wish I had it right now. From that time. Does anybody want to tell me what that time was? Forget about what actually happened there. But from that time, what happened in that time? They got brought to a place of tension. And they made a decision. And you know what the decision was? Don't believe I'm going no further with you. From that time, from that time, he brought them to a place of tension. Let me tell you something, Brother Blake. Jesus wasn't surprised that he brought them there. He did it on purpose, and he will continually. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. I want you to hear me right now. Jesus did not compromise. Even when those closest to him begin to falter in their faith, Boy, I underlined this in my notes, and I made it bold. He felt no responsibility to surrender to their fear. And their fear was, I don't know if I can do it. And Jesus felt no responsibility to surrender to their fear. And Brother Terrence, let me tell you what else he didn't do. He didn't say, my bad, man, I'm so sorry. I know I told y'all you need to come here, but since it hurts your feelings, I'm going to move the line up here. He didn't. Yes, sir.
Um, yes, but by its very nature, bringing brought to a point of tension demands a decision. Because you see, truth is, Kevin, if they would have just stayed right there, he's still going to leave them behind. You see what I'm saying? Because he's saying, let's ramp it up a little bit. They're saying, you know what? Don't think I can go no further with you. So in effect, they did stay right there. He just left them behind. When it says they walked away, they just walked away from following Jesus. Okay? Boy, I'm, I'm doing all right. I want to say that one more time. He felt no responsibility to surrender to their fear of not being able to measure up. That's where carnality and the world system has crept into the church. I don't know if my buddy's watching tonight or not, but if he is, praise the Lord. I'm glad for everybody that watches us. I had a friend call me about their church shutting the doors. And Brother Ronnie, this is true, okay? It's happening all over the United States. Preachers are quitting. They're dropping like flies. We even have a local church here in town that has to share their pastor with another community because they don't have enough pastors to fill the pulpits. But that ain't happening in the United Pentecostal Church. It's not. It's not. We're planting churches. We're adding preachers. We're growing. It's true. Look it up. Fastest growing, not just United Pentecostal, but the fastest growing religious movement in the world is the Pentecostal movement, which is the movement that teaches and preaches that the Pentecost experience is for everybody. And they believe that baptism and the infilling of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, just like they did on the day of Pentecost. And here's what he said to me. He's been here before. We were friends back in the day. He said, that doesn't surprise me that y'all are growing. Okay. I thought he was going to say something like, I know what kind of good pastor they got or something. He said, because you are a counterculture church. He said, you have a higher demand of commitment to go away from the world instead of with the world. And that's what people are looking for. They're not looking for cookie cutter religion. But they're looking for something that upsets them a little bit. You know something? I ain't never had a new worshiper get offended at anything I preached. Matter of fact, they tell me, we came here because you knew that's how we know that's how you preach. We're going to stay here because we know that's how you preach. It's a true story. That's a true story. All right. We are growing. We grew every way during the pandemic, numerically, spiritually, and financially, every way, here at the River Bend. There are only 11 nations in the world that there's not a united Pentecostal church in. Y'all know what that means? We get to preaching the gospel in 11 more nations. You know what that tells the Lord, Brother Billy? I'm ready. Oh, Gabriel. Get that horn out of the case because it's time for you to play your greatest number because my bride's coming home. We're that close. We ain't got time to get offended. And sure enough, ain't got time to get offended at the word. Jesus offended some of his closest friends. When the will of God violates the law of friendship, I said, when the will of God violates the law of friendship, it'll offend you. Here's how it happened. John 11, 1 through 3. Now a certain man was sick 
Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore is the sister sent to him. So here Jesus has these friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Mary and Martha send word to Jesus, Lazarus is bad sick, you need to come take care of him. And Jesus got the message and didn't do nothing for two days. He knew this sickness was going to result in death. It had to. Therefore, he could not go just yet. And he also knew that him waiting was going to offend his friends. Because when he finally arrives, and he's four days late, he's first met by Martha, and then by Mary, and they both tell him the same thing. If you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. You let us down. The purpose of this disease and this death was that Jesus might be glorified. So if Jesus gives in to the desires of his friends, he would have hindered the greater work of God. See, John eleven thirty five. 35, everybody ought to know that shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. Now, I've got a couple of theories about that, and this is one of them. He was not weeping a grieving prayer over Lazarus died. You know how I know that? He's going, he's going to come out of there. So what did he weep for? It was a response, hear me right now, to the weight of doing the will of God when it conflicts with the will of people you care about. He wept because of what they had to go through so that God could be glorified. And he wept because these are people he loves. He cares about them deeply. And he's got to put them off a minute. I feel the Holy Ghost moving in here right now. Yep. His weeping was related to the fact that he was having to help them through a place of tension that caused their lack of faith. Yes. Lazarus didn't come out of the grave. It, Lazarus coming out of the grave had nothing to do with their faith or lack thereof. Right. It had to do with God being glorified. Okay? But he wept. Now, Brother Terrence, he wept to the point that the people around him said, oh, how he loved him. It was the prayer, it was the weep, the cry of a mourner. But he was simply mourning the fact that he could not be for them what they needed him to be when they needed him to be that. Because the will of God has got to be bigger than... Huh. Pastors and leaders will always have to navigate the minefield of offending those that you care about when the will of God is at stake. Pastors and leaders will always have to navigate the minefield of offending those that believe they have special status when the will of God is at stake. I preach that to you and be perfectly honest, I ain't won this one yet. I haven't won this one yet because when I preach the truth and it makes you angry, it bothers me bad. Bad. But I'm going to get delivered from it because woe is me if I preach not the gospel. We must remember, please hear me, our online church, and those that are here with us, we must remember that our present success and our eternal destiny 
depend upon our receptivity to the man of God in our life. You can't be saved without a preacher. That's the Bible. You need a man of God in your life. You need a man of God with authority in your life. Because without submitting to the man of God with authority, you have no authority. Matthew 10 and 41. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. That simply means receive them as they are. Okay? Or a righteous man, same thing. Receive them as they are. Don't, you know, Brother brother Billy brought up a great point in Elements class Sunday, and I'm going to say one more time, if you don't come to Elements, you ought to start. It's good. But when he got Miss Jane's notes and he saw the date was wrong, then that establishes, well, reckon what else is wrong? Okay? When the man of God comes... Your first thought cannot be skepticism when the word violates your comfort zone. You have got to assume the man of God is preaching truth to you. And be surprised if you find out different. Not try to find, oh, I just opened up a can of something right then want to try to find a way it don't apply to me. Okay? And the way I do it is I attack the character of the man of God. Like, for instance, I made myself a promise when I was a little bitty boy because I've been knowing this day was coming that I was going to be a pastor someday. I just didn't know it was here. But I made myself a promise that I would never own a Lincoln Continental True story. You want to know why? Because I heard all kinds of folks talk bad about preachers that drove a Lincoln. True story. I told somebody that in the last couple weeks, Brother Shannon. I made myself a promise. And you know why people start belly aching? Because the pastor drove a Lincoln? Because they didn't like something he preached. So I got to find a way when I don't like something that's happening or I don't like a place he's leading us, I got to attack him personally. Hey, this ain't my first rodeo. Okay? Y'all know I'm telling the truth, right? We, that's how we live life. Somebody at work makes you mad. Next thing you know, you, they, you're talking about don't like what color garden holes they got hung up in their backyard. Really, don't like nothing about them. Don't like nothing they do. Breast stinks, funky haircut. Don't like the clothes they wear. Need to lose a few pounds. Before you know it, Brother Ronnie, you done tore everything about them down. Same way it works in the church. That's why we can't afford to get offended. Because just like we learned also at Elements class, Brother Billy, this is who we're going to war with. This is who we're going to rattle the gates of hell with. This is who we're going to thwart every trick of the enemy with. We can't afford to be falling out with people that we're going to war with. All right, I know it's true. But when we receive the man of God, only as he caters to our preferences, we both stand in danger. Because we're out of the will of God, we're being led by the flesh instead of the spirit. Let me finish up here. Jesus offended John the Baptist. I really want to get this one. I may leave the rest of it for you to get. How does this affect us? When our time has passed, and another is being used. And in that time, it seems like our efforts haven't been noticed and haven't been appreciated. When it's time for an old engine to find a new track and a 
and somebody else is being blessed and being used and we're struggling. And it seems like nobody's noticed what we did and nobody appreciated it. Now, John the Baptist, he was in prison. Everybody say he was in prison. He'd been there a minute. All right? And while he's in prison, he hears that Jesus, oh, Holy Ghost, I need you to work right now because you need to tear down some old, old strongholds right now in the Holy Ghost. Tear down some stuff right now. He's in prison, and he's been there a while. And he keeps hearing that Jesus is out there performing all these miracles. He heard of all the things that Jesus was doing. And Brother Billy, he sent two disciples to Jesus. And he said, go ask him, are you the one that should come or look we for another? Now, John the Baptist knew Jesus Christ in a way nobody else did. He was his cousin, for one thing, and his whole life, he was born to be the forerunner of Jesus Christ and to preach, there's one coming after me who's mightier than I. And the theme he preached consistently was look for Jesus and the Holy Ghost, and I must decrease and he must increase. So why is he asking him, are you the one that should come or look we for another? Why is he asking him that? When you consider the pressure John found himself in, he comes out of the desert. He's wearing a, a cloth of camel's hair, eating locusts and wild honey. And Jesus and his disciples are wearing soft clothes. Remember that? They're wearing soft clothes. And they're eating and they're drinking and they're performing miracles and they're living a successful life. John's preaching once shook an entire area and now he's an afterthought. It seems that John's preaching was easier to preach than it was to live. He must increase and I must decrease. You want to know, Brother Shannon, why John sent some disciples to find out if the miracle worker was the one they were looking for or look we for another? Anybody know? Because if he was the one we're looking for, he's going to get me out of here. Out there healing all these people and delivering all these people and he left me in jail? He can't be the one. He wouldn't do me like that. I made the way for him. Huh? He's out here healing, raising the dead. He, he can do anything. And here I sit in jail. Are you the one that's coming or look we for another? Jesus At that very hour, right there in front of him, he just began to heal many infirmities and afflictions, casting out evil spirits and open the blinded eyes. And then he told him, he said, go tell John everything you saw and heard. Go tell him that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Then he said, 23, and blessed is he, who is not offended because of me. Are you ready for this? He said, you go tell John, I'm exactly who you've been looking for. John, you accomplished what you were intended to accomplish, and this wouldn't be happening without you preaching your message. But you've got to trust me. He then proceeded to tell the people John was the greatest ever born of woman. But I want you to know something right now. I feel the Holy Ghost very strong in this room. And I'm coming to a conclusion just for tonight. We'll start in 10 next time. The Lord knows when you don't understand 
why things aren't working out like you need them to. He knows when you can't comprehend why is all this good things happening to this one, this one, this one, and I'm going through a struggle. My time has passed, I guess. Nobody even knows about me. He does. We don't always see from heaven's point of view. He does not operate in ways we can always comprehend. Do not judge God's work in you and through you based upon your present circumstances. Do not judge what God's doing in you and has done in you and who he has been to you simply by what he's not doing right now. Don't be offended at him. Trust him. Paul got it. Paul got it when he was in prison and he wrote 2 Timothy to the young man that would take his place. You know what he said? I fought a good fight. I kept the faith. I finished my course. No matter what our standing with God, regardless of our past and our present successes, the opportunity to be offended will be presented to us and it might come from people and it might come from God himself. And if you're led by the Spirit, people will be offended by us. Folks will not understand the extent to which God uses us or the manner in which it happens and how it affects us but we cannot be moved from our purpose. Even when we're affected by their lack of understanding, even if it looks like we hurt them. 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. That you no longer should live the rest of your time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. We only talk about the physical suffering Jesus went through. But he also suffered being misunderstood, underestimated, overlooked, and disregarded. But if we arm ourselves with his same mind, we will not be offended in him. Stand with me. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And the old song says, Teach me, Lord, teach me, Lord, to wait. I've got to trust him. He's, his way is perfect. Brother Cody, he is wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the ending, which is and was and is to come, the Almighty. I can't be offended. I can't be offended. Sometime this week, before Sunday, we need to find a place to pray and say, search me, Lord. If I'm sideways, upside down, cattywampus with anybody for anything, I got to get right. I got to get right. Because we're going to war. And Brother Shannon, we're going to another level. We don't want anybody staying behind. Pray with me right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I love you. I thank you. I appreciate you for your word, for truth, the power of the Holy Ghost. I pray, God, that these areas in this Bible study that I don't have active yet, that I haven't whooped yet, I pray you give me strength and courage and just keep on. Be patient with me, Lord. I'm on the way. I'm on the way, Lord. I'm, I'm pursuing you. I want to forget those things that's which behind me and reach for that which is before me. I want to do it with faith and confidence and power and authority. I want to do it confidently and not hesitantly, but keep going forward in the power and the truth of the Holy Ghost and your word in Jesus' name. Amen. What time are we have in church Sunday? 1.30. Y'all done got me offended. It is at 2 o'clock, but we're going to pray at 1.30. We're going to pray at 1.30. Service is at 2. No elements, no Sunday school, no Riverbend kids. 
Love you. You're dismissed. Sign up for the ladies' paint party. Need some more ladies to come. It's going to be fun. $25 a head.